Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Vicki Weber. She is the author of Aurora's Orchid, and we have a wonderful time talking about Puerto Rico, her books, and, and all sorts of wonderful stuff. In fact, I think the only thing we didn't talk about is my upcoming Reading With Your Kids live events that are happening in the Boston area. That's right. Come on out and experience Reading With Your Kids live happening twice this spring. We're going to be at the East Boston branch of the Boston Public Library in just a few days, March 21st. We're going to have a great time. We'll be there from noon to 3 p.m. We'll be presenting our totally interactive magic show, a magic workshop. We'll be having story times, book giveaways, and we'll have a special parenting workshop presented by the folks at the Boston Public Schools Parent University. Like I said, it's all happening at the East Boston branch of the Boston Public Library on March 21st, noon to 3 p.m. And on April 5th, make your way down to Kingston Collection in Kingston, Massachusetts to be a part of the South Shore Kids Expo. There's going to be all sorts of amazing things happening. And one of those amazing things is the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Come on over to our totally interactive booth. Become a part of a future episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. And be sure to check out our totally interactive magic show. It's all happening April 5th at Kingston Collection South Shore Kids Expo. Joining us on the line right now from right outside of Chicago. She is the author of uh, two great books that we're going to be speaking to about tonight. Please welcome to the show, Vicki Weber. Vicki, how are you? Good. How about yourself? Oh, it's wonderful. We don't have any snow in the ground here in Boston right now. This is great. I love it. We actually, um, we got like a warning about a storm and... We got nothing out here. My backyard's all melted, so, you, you know, go. I'll take it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, you know, it's uh, interesting that we're appreciating the, the unusually warm weather here in the northern part of the United States. Uh, the first book takes place in a beautiful part of the world that's sunny almost all the time. Tell us all about Aurora's Orchid, please. So, okay, so my first book, um, Aurora's Orchid, is actually um, based on a true story of my family. Um, it is my first book and I was fortunate enough, um, to keep it a secret from my dad. He knew I was writing books, but he didn't know I was writing that one. And, um, so I got to surprise him with it on Christmas day, um, as his Christmas present. And he actually is one of the characters in the story. Um, and the story is about his mother, um, my grandmother, her name was Aurora and, um, she planted, uh, an orchid in Puerto Rico and it didn't bloom until the day she passed away. Oh. Um, and so it's a huge tradition in my family that anytime someone visits the house in Puerto Rico, you take a picture with the orchid and you send it to all the cousins. And um, so I turned it into a, a children's story um, to teach the importance of family and patience and that sometimes things don't turn out the way you expect them to. <laughs> You know, I've, I've mentioned on the show a, a number of times that my wife, is, my wife's family is originally from Puerto Rico and I have a deep, deep love of Puerto Rico and I've, I've had the pleasure and honor of visiting and, and performing in every town on the island. It's, it's an incredible place. Most people who go down there, they, they go to San Juan, they go to the resorts and those are nice, but you're missing the island. The island is magical. And one of the things that really blew me away the first time I was down there, and uh, it was the first time I was in any kind of tropical paradise or whatever, I, we're, we're walking in El Yunque, the rainforest, and I came upon an orchid growing wildly. And, and these flowers, I'm like, back in Boston, it cost me 50 bucks to get one of these things. And here they are growing in the wild. It's amazing. 
Well, anytime my um, my brother has gone, because uh, there's the um, there's lizards and there's geckos mm-hmm. everywhere, and they they shed your tail, and he was always like, "I'm going to get one this time. I'm going to get one this time." <laughs> <laughs> never never worked out. My mom always hated it. She's like, I, "I'm ready to go home where there aren't." You know, plants everywhere and bugs everywhere and the sun. But my mom is the Irish one, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my Irish mom loved Puerto Rico. But the thing that I'll be honest with you, the thing that because my Irish mom wasn't a big fan of the sun because, like a lot of us, she spends you know more than two or three minutes in the sun and you know she gets sick. Um, <laughs> but she fell in love. I say she fell in love with the island, but what she fell in love with was the people yeah, and the family and the fact that you're down there and you, you can be with folks for just a very short period of time, but you become family almost instantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I brought my, um, my now husband. Um, at the time, he was just my boyfriend. We actually got engaged uh, at the house in Puerto Rico. Oh. Um, but it was amazing because, you know, he, I obviously had these deep bonds with my family, and he didn't know them. And it was, you know, a matter of minutes before they, you know, welcomed him in and treated him like they'd known him all their lives. Mm-hmm. And I definitely feel like, Anybody who's gone to Puerto Rico with me has gotten that same experience. Even um, sometimes I'll go down there and I'll be like, oh, which cousin is this? And my dad's like, oh, that's not our cousin. That's that's so-and-so. They live next door to so-and-so. We just – they're just always at the family parties. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the beautiful the, – before GPS, the, the beautiful thing about you get – when you're getting directions, anytime you're getting directions, you never get street names. No. It was always, you go down and you take a left at Maria's house and you go down and then Consuela, she's always sitting on the porch. So when you get to the her, you take a right there and you, and it's. Everybody knew what that meant. <laughs> and it worked. It, we were able to get around great. But that, that, I, I, it sounds like Aurora's Orchid just really captures that love and that sense of family that is so strong down on the island. Yeah, that was really my goal. And one of my favorite parts about this story um, was that, you know, it is it is a story about Puerto Rico. There are not very many children's books that take place in Puerto mm-hmm. Rico or um, that have all Puerto Rican characters in it. So that was really important for me. But I also um, made a really big point to make sure that throughout the story, I sprinkled Spanish throughout. And mm-hmm. I tried to put it in a way that any English speaker would be able to um, figure out what it meant just through context clues. Mm-hmm. Um, be, but, you know, I really wanted it to be authentic and, mm-hmm. and really reflect um, that authenticity and that language and um, the feeling. Yeah. yeah, that's that's beautiful. One of the I, I have to ask, this is such a beautiful part of, of Aurora's Orchid story that you wrote this book. And you gave it to your dad on Christmas. What was his reaction? Um, so my dad is not a crier. He is, he's a very, um, it's a macho man, emotional man yeah. but, but he's not a big crier. And, uh, so yeah, there were, there were a lot of tears on his end. I actually, so the, the dedication to the book, um, just has a, a, a single orchid. And it says to my father for always reminding me when life got difficult that this too shall pass because that's like his motto that mm-hmm. he says to everything. Um, and then I ended it with Labu most. So when I was little, I couldn't say I love you. And I would say I love Labu. And so <laughs> that's just, he won't tell me he loves me. He like, even when I'm texting him, he won't say he loves me. He says Labu. Uh, so I, I put that in the text for him as well. So I think the dedication is what tipped him over the edge a little. That's beautiful. You know, one of the things, uh, and, and I, it was something that really amazed me when uh, I was welcomed into this beautiful Puerto Rican family and got to know them, is that there's a, it, there are a lot of similarities. You mentioned that your mom is Irish. There's a lot of similarities between the two cultures. And in one of the, I, I probably the biggest, one of the biggest similarities is that there's, more Irish Americans and more Puerto Ricans living in the continental United States than are back on the island, and there's more Irish Americans than are back in Ireland. What a fa- is it's 
mind boggling sometimes to think about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My mom likes to call me um, Sorta Rican. Sorta. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got the Irish half. <laughs> uh-huh. I I like that. I like that. I my, my kids are a little bit older now. I'm not sure if they'd appreciate it. They would have appreciated it when they were they were kids. That's wonderful. What's the reaction been to folks who have uh, experienced Aurora's orchid? Um, yeah, so I've gotten um, really great reviews. I actually just talked to a school today. Um, about they want to include it in their um, dual language program um, as well because they just really like that it does include the Spanish, um, but it has the English context clues. And so they found um, like a lot of value in tying those things together. Um, I'm actually a teacher myself. Um, I teach pre-K through second grade music and then third, fourth, and fifth grade STEAM which is the same as STEM, mm-hmm. just with art added. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've had uh, a lot of work with this at my own school. Um, I do have free lesson plans on Teachers Pay Teachers for it as well with, like, writing prompts um, and that kinds of, of things. But a lot of teachers have reached out and really liked it. I even had a coworker love it so much. Um, she's also Puerto Rican um, that she ordered it as a gift for her grandmother's 100th uh, birthday. Wow. Next month. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. What kind of what kind of conversations can you imagine families having as they're reading Aurora's Orchid together? Aurora's Orchid. Um. It's, well, with families, I think it's just a lot of um, because it does show how um, things progress over time. It is a book that kind of time jumps a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's important to see that all the characters start as, as very young. Um, and with each page, they get a little bit older and their experience with their mother is a little bit different. So this is a really easy gateway to talking to your children about, you know, what, what happens when you, um, grow up and really living in the moment, um, taking advantage of, uh, the opportunities that you have with the people that you have while you have them, um, and not only that, but appreciating everything um, for its worth and its beauty, even if you don't have that um, initial gratification. Mm-hmm. Because throughout the whole story, Aurora uh, insists that this plant is beautiful, and the children keep saying, but it hasn't bloomed. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's it reminds them that that's not the important part. Um so I think that there's a lot of things that a family could take away from this. Yeah, beautiful. You know, one of the things that I love about Puerto Rican culture is that it's family and it's very, very typical to see grandparents uh, and, and kids and grandkids all hanging out and partying together and dancing together and singing together and going to concerts together. And I really, really love that. And I don't think that we do it enough here in the continental United States. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, you know, we, my, my husband is half Cuban, so our wedding was definitely one giant Hispanic Irish party because he's also half Irish. <laughs> um, so we had that that whole thing going on. But, um, yeah, no, I definitely don't think it happens enough. And, um I just think the the whole idea of of family and togetherness here is viewed very differently mm-hmm. um, than in Puerto Rico, and so I was, you know, that was the goal was to try and um, spark those conversations and encourage people to spend more time uh, with the people that they love. Right now, it's it's really easy to get caught up in your phone mm-hmm. um, and the digital world, and um, it's easy to forget the real world. Yeah. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm consciously using the term continental United States is because I want people to understand that Puerto Rico is part of the United yeah. States. And we are all one big family. And right now, well, for the past few years, Puerto Rico has been, been taking it on the chin and, um, and, and they still need help. Um, uh, yeah. Vicky was telling me that some of, some of her family's neighbors down, in the southern part of the island still don't have all of the services that we take for granted that were destroyed during Maria. And now that same part of the island is experiencing pretty, pretty horrible earthquakes. And so, um, you know, whenever you're listening to this, because people listen to the, 
to episodes of the podcast years after we, we've been on for three years now and they listen to it. They, they're still listening to the episodes that came out three years ago. Puerto Rico, we're all one beautiful country and we need to support each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that, that's the thing is a lot of people don't even realize some of um, who have been affected the most. Honestly, when Maria hit, um, you know, my family uh, who, you know, is is fortunate enough to, to be here and doing well for themselves, you know, we sent what supplies we could. Um, but honestly, the family members we were sending it to in Puerto Rico, they weren't really the ones who mm-hmm. needed, um, you know, food and water and supplies. Honestly, it was a lot of the college students because many of the dorms were um, were destroyed and it was very low on the priority list to uh, to rebuild those. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of um, people my age in Puerto Rico who were kind of hurting the most because they were far away from their family mm-hmm. um, on the island and, uh, you know, and didn't have a place to turn to and a way to get back to their family. Yeah. Well, they're in my prayers every, every single night. And um, I just, you know, I, they're going to be back. It's, it's a beautiful island. There's, there's a lot of strength. There's a lot of love and a lot of pride down there. So, um, we're, and we want to support them coming back. One of the things you mentioned is that you're a music teacher, so it makes sense that the new book that was recently released, Laszlo Learns Recorder, is all about music. Yeah, so um, my goal with kind of Aurora's Orchid, um, you know, I have worked in, in schools for this will be my, this is my end of my fifth year coming up. And um, a lot of students are just underrepresented. And so that was kind of my uh, one of many goals with Aurora's Orchid. But with Laszlo Learns Recorder, I really wanted the music teacher in me Mm -hmm. um, to shine. So I actually created um, this story as um, like a supplemental curriculum for my own classroom. So it is interactive. So um, the children who do read the story either on their own or in the classroom um, learn along with the character in the story and play along with the character in the story. Oh, wow. So, um, you know, I have, uh, you can see like what the instrument looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, you learn what it is and how to play it, how to hold it all along with the character. That is, that's genius. What a great idea. And you can learn so, how to read music. You know, music. these are things that teachers could like photocopy if they, you know, wanted to make a poster out of it. But a child could just as easily um, teach themselves at home with it. Um, or it'd be great for a substitute teacher who doesn't really know uh, mm-hmm. how to begin with it. Or you know, there's so many different options. And and a super way for family to come together and learn how to play recorder together. Because there's a lot of parents who they their child comes home with this thing that squeaks really loud and they <laughs> don't like the way it sounds. They don't know what to do about it. I actually covered that in here. He, uh, my character gets very upset that his recorder doesn't sound beautiful the way his teacher's does, and so it goes through. Okay, well if this is the sound, here's what you need to check. Don't do this. You know, this ah. is this is what you want to do. So, um, so yeah, great tool for parents who uh, don't want the squeaking going on at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, it is, and and the the illustrations that you're showing me are are great, and it's very very clear where you where you put the fingering and 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 whatnot. But you know, we we value the the, the benefits that we all get from reading together. What mm-hmm. kind of benefits do you think families will experience if they play music together? There are so many benefits to music, and I I feel like more recently um, schools in general are being more supportive of music programs, um, which is excellent because that wasn't always the case. But there are so many benefits to um, a child's like social emotional skills, as well as um, the academic progress that they can make. But it's just even furthered when they make that connection and have that social time, that quality time with their families. Mm -hmm. Honestly, one of the biggest indicators of success in children is reading to your children. Um, And so, you know, musical experiences just kind of is the cherry on top. It just enhances everything. But um, 
I think that this would be an excellent way for the parents to learn something and the children to learn something um, and and enhance that quality time, that social need yeah. for that. Yeah, it, it, there, there are a lot of things that you're talking about. I'm thinking one of the great benefits is that it, it gives a, a parent and a child a chance to kind of be on a level playing field together for yeah. a minute. You know, it's like, okay, we're both squeaking this recorder. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and it, it's kind of challenging and, and, and that's okay. You know, kids need to understand that it's okay to not be perfect at something and to not give up on yourself. And that's something that I personally feel like this um, this generation I'm working with now, I feel like that is a huge struggle for them because they are intelligent, they are creative, but they um, don't do well when they don't get things right the first time. So they either rely too heavily on somebody else or like don't believe in themselves enough. And it's, um, you know, it's a hard thing to teach, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's it's something we have to do because... You know, we got to get them there. It's important. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you mentioned that, that learning how to play an instrument, music, helps with a child's social-emotional growth. How? What's that connection? Um, so uh, there's, there's honestly, there's, there's so much that goes into it. Um, when uh, a parent or a teacher, a friend, when someone is reading out loud, um, they're... Anyway. So basically, um, there are like voices that you'll do. Mm -hmm. There are um, emotions that are involved. So there's a lot of modeling. If a character is upset, you're probably not going to be reading the book like a robot. Mm -hmm. um, so students and children, they start to pick up on the nuances of the tone in somebody's voice or the facial expressions. They start making those connections between someone's voice and what they see on the page. And that helps them to um, distinguish between those in real life because children are naturally egocentric. Mm -hmm. um, they're just, that's the way they're designed. So it is really difficult for them to see things from somebody else's perspective um, and reading to them and with them uh, helps them understand what somebody else's perspective is. Mm. And, you know, as you were speaking, I'm thinking, you know, early we were talking about Aurora's Orchid earlier in, in beautiful Puerto Rican culture. I think music is one of those gateways that's the, probably the easiest way to gain a perspective, you know, to, to start learning for, uh, uh, another culture, to be, you know, kind of start to look at, at through to the, at the world through, through that different culture's perspective. And it's safe and it's fun. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what a beautiful gift it is to give to our kids. Absolutely. And, you know, in my music class, I love to teach um, songs in other languages because you don't need to um, speak a language fluently to sing a song in another language. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really amazing to, you know, play traditional games or, or sing a song in, from a different culture and then for the students to then learn what that song means or how it came about, um, it's really important, you know, historically and culturally. And again, offering that perspective um, because songs, you know, generate from human feelings and emotions. Um, and so it's it's really interesting to have them experience that and important for them to experience that. Yeah. And I'm thinking too, going back to that whole social emotional development, it's music is very expressive and expresses emotions and you can feel it. And that would be a really kind of a great way to start talking to our kids uh, about, uh, about emotions. You know, we've had guests on that talk about, um, attaching a color to an emotions, you know, yeah. how, how are you feeling today? Oh, I'm red. I'm kind of angry. Um, you know, when we're listening to music with our kids, it's a great way. To, well, how do you feel when you when you listen to this? What does it make you feel like? What do you think the the, the composer was feeling when he made that? Is the sound angry? Does it sound happy? Does it sound sad? And and I think that would be a really valuable way for us to to help our kids kind of learn about emotions. 
Well, absolutely. And the hard part, especially with younger kids, is sometimes they'll be feeling something and they don't even know what they're mm-hmm. feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, so they might be, you know, frustrated or, you know, whatever it might be. And they might not even have the words to tell somebody what they're feeling. So music and reading is a fantastic way to introduce that vocabulary to them um, to help them express their own mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. needs and feelings. Yeah. And one thing bef- before we be- before we wrap up, you you mentioned um earlier that kids kids who play musical instruments uh, they do better in school. I, yeah. I I don't want folks to miss that because it's so important because parents are like a, a lot of parents are crazy about grades. You got to get good grades and blah, blah, blah. And I, so I don't want you to play. We, we had a, a, an international student from from China living with us and um, she wanted to play piano so much. She loved it. She loved it. And we had a keyboard here. And I said, please feel free. And she goes, no, my mother doesn't allow me to play. She wants me to focus on my studies. And if I only spoke Mandarin Chinese, I would have called her mother up and said, this will help her get competitive grades. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I'm not going to get all sciencey, you know, um, but there's a great book. I, I can't remember the author off the top of my head, but it's, um, this is your brain on music. Ooh. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, I've learned so much about, um, music just helps like your neural synapses, all those connections neurally in your brain are all strengthened. The more you're exposed to music, the more you do with music. Um, and so there is no downside, um, to getting your kids involved in anything and everything musical because it will just strengthen all of their connections to, um, to mathematical, you know, to, to literacy, to all of those core subjects. Um, it's just going to benefit them. It, it, it sounds like you're saying something I used to hear many years ago, like well-rounded kids are happy and successful and they don't have to just focus on one thing. Right. Well, and that's the other thing is um, kids really struggle because they always want to be the best at everything. They always want to be perfect and the best in this area and it's important to realize that, you know, some, you're not always going to be the best at everything, but you'll be good at, at something. Mm-hmm. And you want to be the best well-rounded individual you can be. You want to make sure, you know, you're happy. You, um, you know, can, fu- can function well. You find a job you like. You surround yourself with people you like. Um, and that those things are more important than being the best at this one particular thing in this one area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a huge takeaway. And I, I really hope that parents heard that. And I really hope that, that we all try to help each other remember that. Cause that's, uh, parent, if, uh, adults forget that stuff too sometimes. It's, you know, living that full quality of life and having the beautiful relationships, having those relationships that we so cherish down in Puerto Rico and being there for each other and just, just living life. I've had a great time in this moment in my life speaking with the author of Laszlo Learns Recorder and Aurora's Orchid, Vicki Weber. Vicki, I-, I had a blast speaking with you. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I had a blast as well. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be our friend, Dr. Terrence Shipman. He'll be back to let us know about the brand new addition to his Kindergarten Chronicle series. It's called The Field Day. I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Shipman back. We always have a great time speaking with him. We want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to thank our guest, Vicki Weber. Be sure to check out both of her amazing books. Also want to thank the members of my team. I want to thank my amazing producer, Fatima Khan, for all she does for the show. I want to thank my author ambassador, Peggy Cotto. If you are looking for help helping your book stand out from the crowd of books that are published every single month, be sure to check out my friend Peggy. She will let you know how we can help you. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she offers me. I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of 
the Reading With Your Kids podcast. 